amazing sessions. And today we're going to focus on SYNC. We're going to have an amazing program with fantastic professionals that are going to um, tell us about the new developments in the SYNC uh, space. And also we're going to have music supervisors from all over the place that are going to be here uh, listening to music and, and choosing music for their, for their SYNCs. And also we'll have the uh, great Patti Carreras doing a workshop on uh, how to present your music to music supervisors. But before starting, it is necessary, and I really want to thank Primavera Pro for making this possible one more year, uh, all the logistics and being a, such a great partner, and also to our sponsors, um, Interstellar Music Group and Too Young, who, thanks to them, we can do these sessions uh, today. They, they were very uh, generous to contribute, uh, to support the event, to bring all those professionals from different parts of the world, so we are very thankful for that. And I will not take more of your time, and more especially more time of the panel. So I will pass the word to Joan from Too Young. And yeah, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jordi. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, today in the Synchronize Me workshop. As uh, Jordi mentioned, we will be talking about new developments in the scene world and how the landscape of uh, SYNC has changed in the past few years, and what, is, what can be the role of tech in the future of SYNC. Uh, well, Jordi already introduced me. I'm Juan Jimenez from uh, Too Young. Uh, we are a music supervision company that mostly work with fashion, but we also do some films. And we are also working on uh, developing new tools to help us on, the, on, our, on our job, which is uh, music supervision. And today uh, we have a fantastic panel. Uh, next to me we have David Will. She, he's a former uh, senior VP of SYNC at Cobalt. Now he leads a global synchronization at Interstellar Music uh, Services and he also uh, founded and ran his own music monitoring uh, company and he's responsible for licensing uh, music uh, of artists as uh, PJ Harvey, Sia or Nine Inch Nails. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Emma Lomas, head of licensing of the Beggars Group. Uh, for the ones that you don't know, Beggars, it's for AD. It is also Matador, big fan of Matador, uh, Excel uh, recordings, uh, Rough Trade, and Young. And this means that they have in their roster artists such as The National, Yaeji, Perfume Genius, uh, Queens of the Stone Age, uh, amazing uh, bands. Uh, recently, they won uh, the Ames uh, Sync Award for Independent Sync of the Year with a very beautiful cover of uh, Lisa O'Neill's of a song by Bob Dylan, All the Tired Horses, for TV show <coughs> Peaky Blinders that maybe you are familiar with. It's a beautiful scene. I won't tell you more, so there's no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> and then next to Emma, last but not least, Paulina Marquez. Uh, she's a music supervisor with almost 20 years of experience in the film and uh, music industry. She worked uh, for some advertisement uh, at the beginning of her career, but now she's specialized in films and TV shows. Uh, you can see her work in uh, Netflix uh, TV series Elite. And not only that, she also co-founded the independent and experimental music festival uh, Skiff? Skiff. Skiff in Brussels. So please welcome this amazing plan and a round of applause. So maybe we can give a very short introduction of what a music supervisor does. Maybe Paulina can give us a two sentences or three of what your job is as a music supervisor for a TV show of Netflix, for example. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the work of a music supervisor is basically to to supervise and to propose every musical aspect within a film. So, um, I mean, it sounds pretty straightforward when you say it like that, but it's actually not that straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, usually to propose the music of a, for a film, uh, before you need to to understand what is the role of the music, how is the music being used within that film, and uh, you need to create a creative concept around it, no? Uh, what's gonna be the sound universe of the film. And that is usually um, 
that is usually something you come up with after uh, long conversations and reflections you have with the director, with the score composer, um, with the, even the sound designer, no? and it's obviously affected by all the other aspects within the film. So the job of the, of the music supervisor is both a creative uh, work when proposing the music for the film, but you also have to take into account that the music that you propose uh, or, or this concept can be done within a specific budget, within a specific time frame, and in a way you work kind of like a bridge between uh, the directing team of the film and the musical team of the film. Either if it's the score composer, well, with that the, the conversation is a bit more aligned, but uh, music producers, um, I mean, etc. And how, how do you take it, uh, how do you access to all the music uh, available? You have a script, you have an idea of the music, and then you say, okay, I'm going to go into the 120,000 songs that are published every day on Spotify. Do you have some tools that help you on that part of the, of the job? I mean, um, you are nurtured uh, everywhere. No, I mean, you can suddenly be having a coffee with your friend uh, somewhere and you listen to the song and you're like, wow, that would be amazing for this. Or you can be uh, going through your Spotify's daily mix or weekly mix recommended, or you can go to Bandcamp or to SoundCloud. There are many different places where you can access music. You have the music libraries. Um, but the thing is, uh, you have to discern between you have to discern what music can really help um, create the musical concept of the project. So you have, yeah, of course you have different uh, tools now that you can use. You have especially tools that I really love for, I mean, now you don't have to go with a lot of hard drives everywhere, you know, carrying your music all around, which was the case not, not many years ago. So there's definitely been advancements when it comes to storage. Uh, when it comes to having uh, different applications to organize, categorize your music, which also help. Uh, you have, uh, some years ago, when you were looking, for example, for a specific song for a scene, and um, you wanted help with that, what you would do is you would throw out a pitch, you know, for, to labels and to publishers, so I would go to them, to them and years. I would tell them, you know, I have this project, I would explain the context of the project, the film, the genre, the everything. We have this scene, we're looking for this type of song with this type of emotion, we have this type of budget. So send me what you think could work. And uh, you would have, there would always be the publishers and the labels who would just throw, I don't know, maybe the artists they wanted to push at that moment or uh, whatever catalog they wanted to promote at that moment. Or maybe they really did the job, but they just didn't really have the same musical taste that you have and the same sensibility that you have. You didn't connect with them. And you would have publishers and labels that would really send you something that you would say that really works. So you would, you would know who you could uh, contact for that. And now you have a lot of search engines that are supposed to help you to find similar tracks. No? So basically, these search engines have uh, a lot of information tagged within the song, so you can just drop your song, and supposedly they will show you a list of options that can really work for you. Is this, is this something that maybe you are also using on the label side when you receive a pitch to, to navigate your catalog? Because the catalog can, of a label can be immense, and it's inhuman to, to know all yeah. the tracks. In, Yes, yeah, so we at Beggars we use Disco, which I think is a widely kind of accepted tool among supervisors yeah. and rights holders for licensing. Um, so yeah, we you know years ago, I guess we would get a pitch, or if we were working on something, you would have to go through your iTunes library or you know wherever you stored the music, and you know, we it's a catalogue of probably 25 now 30,000 songs. So it doesn't matter how long you've worked there, you won't have listened to everything. So 
it was difficult. So you would end up just probably pitching the same songs or the most well-known ones or the, the parts of the catalogue you were familiar with. Whereas now, we use disco, it's, everything is in there. So everything that's been serviced to the DSPs sits in, uh, in our disco account. And the music's tagged. So we, it, it is a great tool for us to be able to, it's improved our pitching. Because we can search, you know, you start putting a playlist together and then you can see where that song's been put uh, in Before. other playlists. And it's just, it's widened everyone's kind of knowledge of the catalogue as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're a big fan of, of that, that platform. <laughs> Would you say that this helps you also to serve the increased volume of uh, productions? I mean, uh, Paulina works on Netflix, so she worked with Netflix, so... Before, uh, you would have a movie a year which had uh, 20, 25 cues. Now you have a TV show with uh, <laughs> 10 episodes, and each episode, it lasts for one hour. So maybe there's already 15 cues to cover. So there's a lot of work. And also, on, uh, we see it on the, on the advertisement side. Uh, we, we went from uh, big campaigns, one track uh, for TV, to a lot of content, especially aimed to Instagram, and now yeah. TikTok but with a very fast turnover. Is this something that helps you also disco and other tools to, to serve uh, these pitches? In, in the way that it does save time, so we're able to probably do more searches, but we don't use that tool for the licensing process, so it is still that, and I think that is the main change over the last few years, like the volume of work. Um, you're just doing so many more licenses. So in the pitching side of it, sometimes because we're not a very big team, you know, sometimes that kind of has to go to the bottom of the to-do list mm -hmm. um, because we just have so many requests. Yeah. But certainly having the tagging and making the ability to put playlists together quickly has definitely sped up the, the work process. Yeah, I, th I think also something that is related then to the second part of the of the of Paulina's work is okay. You found the music and then you have to license it, and <laughs> hopefully it comes from beggars and everything is well and tidy. <laughs> but it's not always the case. Uh, so I think uh, David is working to help uh, artists to to organize a bit better their their work and. Uh, we were talking before, uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, an artist as Beyoncé or, or Kendrick Lamar would have 10 writers on, on, the, on their song, but now any kid that is doing uh, tracks at home, they also have 10 writers and not all of them are you know, published or have organized or even have a contract signed. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the thing I would say is, as we've touched on, is that sync, the velocity of sync is, is increasing every year. So there's more and more opportunities out there. There's Netflix, as you've already mentioned. Um, there's more happening on Instagram and TikTok and online. And the big hero ads that, that we used to see, the, the big, big budget ads, there's less of those ones that are, that where the brand will make one ad per year or maybe one ad for 24 months. Mm -hmm. They'll make six or seven ads in that period now and use six or seven different pieces of music and they'll switch them out a lot. So the, the, the speed at which um, sync is moving is increasing, but there's increased opportunities as well. So it's kind of a bit more granular. And, and as Emma said, that means there's more licensing to do. So there's a lot more administration. And, and for anybody here who, who doesn't work in sync, Sync is not just about listening to music and, and pitching songs to a director. You know, that's part of the job. The other part is making sure you can clear the rights. So you need to have an organizational capability where you can look at a song or a copyright and you know who the shares are. And if they're not your shares, then, then maybe you know who to contact. You know, I might reach out to Emma at some point and say, look, we've got a sync happening. Can, can we get this moving? She might reach out to me. There's very much a collaborative element to it. So, what does, what, what does tech do to help organize that? I mean, disco is a really good one because you can put notes in disco and you can keep track of things. Uh, you can put notes in your pitching, which is, uh, just to explain, one stop. What, what, because everything's going quicker, if you can control both the master and 100% of the publishing, then you can basically approve that pretty quickly or quicker than multiple parties. So there's that, if you can have one stop. And if you don't have one stop, and a way of knowing 
who the other writers are and who to contact to clear those, I think is really important. And I just want to touch on one of the things we just mentioned, which is that Disco last week launched um, a, a new feature where you can put a YouTube link in. The music supervisor, like Paulina, might send the thing saying, and we want songs like this, and it might be a, a YouTube link or, or you know, a Spotify link, but let's take a YouTube link. You can put that into Disco now, and it will search your catalog for similar songs that are tagged in a similar way. That's really, really great, providing the tagging that you have in your disco think is sort of aligned yeah. with what it's hearing on YouTube. And I'll give you a really good example of the thing that happened at a previous company that I worked at, which I won't name, is they had humans tagging music and they had a young team come in and, and spend time tagging a huge catalog of songs. And one of those people in that tagging team thought that Britpop meant British pop. And of course, Britpop is 90s, really. It's Blur and Oasis and that kind of era. <laughs> so what happens now when you search that catalog is it, you put Britpop in and every British pop single ever recorded. <laughs> right? So it's simple things can creep in where, where the tech can really help you. But you know, it doesn't mean that, that the, the search element needs to match the tagging element. And if a human being has been involved in that, yeah. what is the subjective element that's come into it? Um, so I think, you know, for me, the, music, the, the role of the music supervisor is enhanced with, with technology. We can move quicker, as we've talked about pitch. We can maybe license quicker because we've got better access to um, data on who the songwriters are. But there's always going to be that human element at the heart of it, which needs to be managing that technology. Would you agree with this? You also encounter this, this, <laughs> this audio similarity or tagging issues yeah. when you use these tools? Or? Yeah, the thing is, you know, um, I mean, the, Brit the Britpop thing, the story is a very good one. But, you know, the other day I was, uh, so we're working on a series now, and we're in this, like, weekly meeting, and then the, uh, the como se dice, la editora, the montage, so she says, you know, like, yeah, the, the cue you sent to the original score composer, you know, we need something like really, uh, we need suspense, we need emotion. And so I turned to them and we were, the three of us, you, you know, we were looking at each other and we were like, well, it's there. And she would be like, well, well for me, that cue, the way I feel it, it's like, it's really, I don't, I don't remember what she felt, if it was like really sweet or really, and we were like, what? Because at the end of the day, the way, the way we perceive things, the way we see things, it's, it's part of who we are, the experiences we've lived, the, the, you know, are the, the part that makes us unique individuals. And that's why um, when, I, when I work on a project, it sounds a bit like me, you know? And when someone else, when, for example, I started working on the fourth season of Elite, something changed in the music of the series because another person was doing it. And I do believe um, music is way too complex and too subtle to, yeah, um, it, it needs that uh, human input, you know? I, th I think we all encounter this issue when navigating uh, libraries or disco tagging and, and especially with the mood thing, uh, it's very relative. Uh, we're working on some tools and we totally discarded talking about moods because what you said that can be mysterious for one person, for the other one is, is cheerful. Yeah. It depends on, on your taste or on, on your mood. So, but th they are, there is some, some elements that, can, that are, let's say, objective. A song, a song can be an instrumental, it can have a, a vocal, a female vocal or a male vocal. You can also have the tempo. You could agree on the genre, at least on the, on the main genres. It's also a mess when you look at the Spotify uh, genre naming. It's, they have a genre for I'm sitting in a couch taking a coffee, <laughs> listening to jazz. Yeah. So that, I don't know if that's really helpful. Uh, so I think there's a part, as you mentioned, that what tags are you going to use to, to, to classify your music? Is this going to be actually useful? But there's also some, some tools that, that we've seen and we've tested that it's they go a bit beyond the tagging and they really take the, the print of, a, of an audio file, the same as they would do with a, with a photograph. And they, they actually comparing 
Yeah. I don't know the, the, the back because mm -hmm. I'm not a, a IT, but they are actually comparing how it looks to, to find similar tracks. And some of them, I have to, I have to admit, they're very impressive. They, they, we've tested some and, 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 and you, you get results that you think, okay, I don't know why this song is similar to this one, because it's not the same chord progression. So this is the typical thing that you would hear on a similarity tool. The, yeah. You have the same chords, you have the same VPM, the, the, the bass line sounds the same. But this one was throwing you back files or songs that had the same, that thing that you think, oh yeah, it has something that it's there, I don't know what. Of course, not this would be three of the 20 tracks they, they send you, but if you already have three selected. It's not bad. It's, it's not bad. bad. And imagine you have, uh, you have a catalog like Beggars, you have 30,000 songs. Yeah. It's impossible to know them all. And this gives an opportunity, I would say, for, for artists, and I wanted to also talk uh, about how sync can affect an artist uh, and their careers. And, and maybe on a, on a back catalog of an artist, they have a, two or three hits that of course everyone knows and they, they, are, they bring revenue, but there's also a, a, a long tail of music that is sitting there that could be ideal for a scene on, 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 on a TV show or, a, or an ad. And it's waiting yeah. for retap. So. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into that one. Uh, absolutely 100%. And, and, and Interstellar, we, we work with up-and-coming artists who are, who are building their careers, but we also work with what we call rights-reverting artists. So we talk to a lot of managers who, who say, hey, I got all my rights back. And we say, okay, good. Now what are you going to do? And they're like, yeah, okay. And they need to manage those rights. So, you know, registering for collection and making sure the money's coming through, that's all fine. Those catalogs, though, are, are probably unlikely to get a marketing and promotion campaign. You know, that, that's something that's not going to happen. But if they can get a sync, that is a marketing and promotion campaign all in itself. So, you know, everyone talks about the Kate Bush moment that happened last year on Stranger Things, and that's great, and it's, it's an outlier. But you can also have something that's happening under a blanket license on a, a popular um, reality TV show where people are connecting with that. And, and where a song comes into a production, whether it's on, on Elite or whether it's on a really kind of cool uh, other Netflix series or an ad or, or a bit of reality TV, some, if, if the supervisor and the director and the producer and the rights holder have done a really good job, that magic happens where yeah. you're watching picture and the music is speaking to you and you connect and you Shazam and not only you but hundreds of thousands or millions of other people Shazam and that song is suddenly, you know, in people's minds. And it's, uh, you know, my background, I worked in marketing and promotion. I was a radio plugger. I was a marketing guy. You know, you, you plan campaigns. You take weeks and weeks to make sure it goes to radio at the right time. You put a nice packaging together, lots of PR, and you do all of that careful planning. All of that stuff can happen in literally 15 seconds in a sync where a whole audience wakes up and goes, I fucking love that song, that's amazing, you know? Yeah. And, and then the catalog is, is released again. And I'll, there's a couple of things happening in, in the UK at the moment which make me smile. One is that um, Marks & Spencer, I think everyone knows Marks & Spencer, it's a very staid British brand that sells nice clothes, you know, very safe clothes. Uh, the current sync for them is Primal Scream, so it's like, wow, Primal Scream is selling Marks & Spencer, but it works. <laughs> And Nationwide, which is a building society that is to encourage you to save your money and save for the future, Oasis. So it's amazing that, you know, that those songs are, are being used by those brands. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating how that's happened. So, yeah, I think, you know, a, a sync can be absolutely magnificent in terms of bringing a song back to life, for sure. Yeah, we, we're seeing it at the moment. I think uh, a lot of the fashion, uh, the designers and the labels, the, the shows have all... The fashion's been very influenced by the 90s, and so the music is also being being used. So, you know, in the last couple of years, we've licensed tracks from like Lush and Cocteau Twins to Gucci and Chanel. Are there? So, those parts of the catalogue that we probably haven't done anything with for a while, all of a sudden, they're being synced regularly. And then another example that's a bit more of an obvious and a big one, but an old track. Like Radiohead Creep has been used in Guardians of the Galaxy, and that is now back in the charts. It's in the it's in the Shazam charts. Um, yeah, just just off the back of the film. So, you know, those those ones are quite, like they are rare, like where it has that much of an impact. But just generally, I think the catalogue's getting. It's not just sort of like the frontline artists or the big hits anymore. Mm. We're licensing, you know, tracks. I've worked at Beggars for 14 years. And in the last six months, we've licensed tracks that I've never even heard of 
or <laughs> have certainly have never licensed before. So, yeah, it is a very exciting time. It's a great opportunity for, for artists. No? Mm -hmm. I also find it funny, I, I, I don't know which movie I, I saw lately, it was also one superhero movie, and, I, and they were using Guns N' Roses, and I thought, who would think that uh, Guns N' Roses <laughs> would be on a, on a major blockbuster uh, cinema? Or, or nowadays. No, uh, nowadays, <laughs> yeah, it, they were like, I mean, you see pictures of Axel Rose, it's the last <laughs> fancy <laughs> thing you want to have, but it worked on the, on the, on the movie. So. Like, can I just add one thing there, for also for any, any up-and-coming artists, is that if you speak to managers, and they get a, a small sink, not, not a sink that everybody talks about, but a sink that happens in a TV show or, or maybe an ad, and you ask them what's happening on Spotify and Apple Music, they see that spike happening, you know? Immediately from something happening yeah. on TV in, in a sink, in a series or whatever, there's an immediate response on streaming, and sometimes that's quite significant in terms of revenue as well. Okay, I also wanted to talk a bit, the, the, uh, there's some elephants in the room, uh, from the latest developments, uh, we have everyone is talking about uh, AI, music generated. Uh, you write a, a pitch, a pitch that you we've probably sent before to a label, and it uh, brings back some music. It doesn't really work right now, well. But what are your thoughts? Is there something there that can disrupt? Uh, are you? You think? I mean, of course, we all think that artists are a different league. But what are your thoughts on on? these new texts? I don't know. I, I, I mean, the way I see it is, uh, I think if we, if we treat them as I think they, I mean, I think we should treat it as, a, as another tool, you know, as a tool that we can access and that we can use as long as we are aware that uh, the human I input that we were talking about, essentially, you know, uh, we were talking about creative arts here, we're talking about film, we're talking about cinema, we're talking about music, we're talking about ways of expression. And I believe that if we consider AI and all types of uh, applications and technolog technological developments as tools we can access, uh, but ultimately we discern on how we use them and what we take from them, I don't know, I think it's not as scary as it sounds, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see in five years who's in this yeah, panel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some robots. <laughs> I, think, like, I think if you look at ad pitches, um, which I'm sure we've all, we've all seen, like the, the words that they use, they come up again and again. And so I think if, if you put those words into, you know, if AI was to then do a search or, you know, whatever, based off those... When you, when you get an ad pitch and then you see what, and you put your selection through and then you see what they finally chose, it never matches up <laughs> because they're using words and, it, and like you've said before, it means something different to everybody. So they put down what they think and then I think part of being a rights holder and having done this for a long time, you kind of learn to read between the lines and what you think they might actually mean, not what they've said. Yes. Um, because 95% <laughs> of ad briefs are looking for uplifting, uplifting yes. emotive Favorite. music. Yeah. <laughs> but Crescendo. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think we will always need that the, the tech stuff is great and it is a good tool, but I think because music is so subjective, it's always going to need a human element, which is you know, what we've said. I think also now, for now, it also misses the whole context of a, of a brief. Uh, it, can it, can, it can bring you back some music, but, but it doesn't know the client, it doesn't know the history of, of that director in a movie or, or a brand, what they have they been using, what, uh, what the, the, the image behind, so that you, it, can, it can serve you some music. Okay, this is a pop rock uplifting, great. Yeah. But it doesn't match the image or it doesn't match the brand. And, this is something that not only it's a, I would say it's a human thing, but it's also a relation yeah. with a with a director, with a client, if it's a it's a brand, and with the with the right holders as well. When 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 we contact you, we, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we that's have a the relation. thing with the tech. It just brings back a search. It's not necessarily going to be aware that a certain band wouldn't touch advertising at all, yeah. or you know with the rights holders might only have. A ter certain territory for um, you know all of that stuff that's knowledge based. And do you think that that because that actually that kind of knowledge could be 
uh, a part of attack system. Mm. This is something that would help you as well, uh, uh, or, or, or music supervisors, if they yes. send you a pitch or, or <laughs> this. No, this, this, we, we encountered this situation in, in, at Too Young uh, some years ago where we had secured a, a song for, a, for an app, for a beer app. Uh, so, and it was, it was a good money, it wasn't something small. And the, the day before launching it, uh, the, the artist declined because he was a, uh, because of religious uh, reasons. Mm. So, and they didn't, they didn't know on, on, the, on the label. So this is something that shouldn't be so difficult if you have a management team. Uh, and, and Just, yeah, I, that's, that's really interesting, that. And I, I think one of the things that futurists might say to you is you'll never have that problem with AI music because it's never going to say no, right? Which is <laughs> no, kind yeah, of yeah, I, I, I meant I mean more, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I mean more for, for actual music, for music that art is created, but that you have on, okay, this artist has this set of tracks. He's okay with, uh, or she's okay with uh, having it on a on a on a car ad, but he they don't want to have it on an alcohol or or sex mm -hmm. or to violence. To insert it in the metadata of the song, so you know it up front. Yeah, that's you, what you mean. I, th I think it wouldn't be so. Yeah, difficult. it would be bad. I think, I mean, I think you can put those inputs into a song so when the AI searches, it's, it says, you know, no automotive, no banking, no meat, and I think that, that's <laughs> eminently doable. I think one of the questions that we were, we were sort of looking at also is, what about music that's only been created by AI? Yeah. So, you know, I want a song that sounds like Primal Scream, um, and please make me that song so that I can go and license it without having to speak to Primal Scream, right? That, that's one thing. I think it, in that situation, the technology is, is getting better and better, but I think, this is my, my personal view, is it lacks the humanity, right? The technology can write that piece of music for you, but that technology has never had its heart broken, it's never been abandoned, it's never fallen in love, it's never felt you know, bereft or been mourning someone it's yeah. lost. And I think that's, as human beings, I think we all feel that when we hear a piece of music that connects with us, it's because a human being made it, and they put, they opened up their their pain and their their, their life and their living to us. And so that, I think, is is one of the things that maybe, you know, the, in in certain respects, will never be part of of AI generated music. Um, I think also there's another thing that happens quite often with directors and producers and and an ad agency specifically, as you present a song. And they immediately go and look for the artist. And if the artist is touring and playing the coolest indie venue just around the road yeah. from them, that's good, right? If the artist is in the press, that's good. If the artist is, is a living, breathing uh, entity that has an Instagram and a TikTok and all kinds of stuff happening, that's good. If they search and they hit a brick wall because it's, it's AI, and I know there's avatars and all that stuff coming too, but it's AI, it doesn't tour, doesn't really have a sort of social media platform, you know, isn't speaking about mental health issues or whatever that thing is, those create those those visual people kind of go a bit cold pretty quickly. Now I think there's there's an audience coming who are just into AI music with avatars. Who are you know it's already happening. I think in Japan and Korea you can you can be a fan of something that's completely machine generated. But I think for sync, um, that human connection, that that link between our experiences, um, and also an ability to see someone operating in a creative way is really, really important. And I don't think AI-generated music can deliver that. I think we all agree on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think also one, one uh, speaking about the, the, the award uh, Beggars Just Won, the, the combination of, okay, we have this great song with this great artist and it becomes something else. This is also the AI. Yeah. Okay, you could say make a cover of this, sing it like that, but it also misses uh, the all artist uh, aura. The heart. The heart. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I, I, we're going to have one more topic, and then we will jump into the questions for the audience, uh, if there's any. Uh, I don't know if you, I've, I'm sure you, you've heard the last week's uh, uh, TikTok uh, has released a, a pre-cleared commercial uh, library for their, their users. Uh, what are your thoughts as a as a music supervisor or a copyright uh, right holder? I'll leave this one to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so for those that don't know, there's a there's the the general music library on TikTok where you can make your cat video, your yeah. dancing video, and, and use music. No brands involved. That that that's fine. You can use that for free. There's now a commercial music library where rights holders like myself or ourselves 
can pre-clear uh, music to go into the commercial music library, and they're saying that you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of brands can then use that music at a pre-approved rate, and some of that money will flow back to, uh, to the songwriter and to the, the recording artist. So it's a really interesting one because on TikTok, brands arrive, they're trying to hit a moment, they're moving really, really quickly, they make a quick bit of content and they want to license some cool music. And as soon as they hit that, want to license some cool music, they hit the old system of, okay, let's write it all out, let's take it to the rights holders and get an approval, it takes a few days, let's come back to you, let's agree a fee and negotiate, and they're like, time. I need to do this today, right? So the pre-clear, the CML, the content, uh, the uh, commercial music library, allows us as rights holders to put music into that library for people to access. And there's a couple of case studies that they, they show where that music gets used, and because it's TikTok, hundreds of millions of people, sometimes billions of people, come across the piece of music. So it's really interesting. I think you cannot ignore the opportunity on TikTok. You cannot ignore the audience size on TikTok. You cannot ignore the transformative potential of your song being used there but you also need to protect your copyright and your songwriter and your artist at the same time. So it's a bit of a balance. Um, you know, we, we're, we're definitely gonna check it out and, and put some music up there, not all of our music, but we're gonna put some music in there. And, and I suspect, I, I have an optimistic view that actually for certain artists, this will be an amazing opportunity um, to have their music used in, in small, quick moving campaigns that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access through TikTok. And no matter what you think about uh, of TikTok, it, its place in the music world right now is, is you know, it's it, huge and it's transformative for a lot of people. So, yeah, I think, you know, I'll, I'll finish on this with the tech. You know, we, we all come from, we're all music fans. This is what we, we grew up as music fans, sharing music with friends. That's what, what our passion was. We end up as music supervisors working in this thing. And I personally feel blessed, I think. Completely, just like <laughs> 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 the microphone. Thank you, I'm back. Um, the, you know, the opportunities for artists um, are changing, and we we have to change with them, and we have to try and make sure that we access those, those opportunities for them. I think that's the point I was trying to make. <laughs> and it always takes some time, you know, when you when you hit a new media, and you have to see in which way you're going to organize it for example it's happening now with metaverse no like when i work with netflix they don't really ask us to clear anything related to that but now with amazon it, it happens and and obviously uh, you talk to labels you talk to publishers and they they don't really know how to deal with it because because it's the first time we have to deal with it you know even me it's like okay we have to think about this in which way are you going to exploit the music there how is it going to happen but it's definitely going to happen so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. Like generally, and this is a wide generalization, the licensing and sync side of and labels in general have always been a bit too slow with the new technologies. Mm -hmm. And so something comes up and everyone's sort of scrambling to well, how do we deal with this? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the right fee level? It, I, I don't think it's low. I just believe it's so complicated the way yeah. it actually works, you know, because when you think about uh, when you're actually clearing a song for a film or for whatever, the, all the things you have to do to really be able to use the music the way you do, it's, it's complicated. It's yeah. a complicated structure. So, mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people involved, a lot of parties involved, you know? So it's actually like, how are we going to go all together and how are we going to organize it and how is it going to work? So it actually works for everyone. Mm. It's not an easy thing to, yeah, it's tricky. I think it's interesting that it, it is complicated and there's lots of people involved. And then you throw it into Web3 and Metaverse and it, it, it's just a whole new world, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's exciting. I mean, it really is super, super exciting how, where music is being used. Um, Emma and I were talking yesterday as we, we, we arrived in Barcelona about, it turns out we were in the same building at Warner Music back in the 2000s sometime, and what that sync team looked at, looked like then to what it looks like now. You know, the, the importance of sync, the, 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 the ability of sync to be very beneficial for artists, both financially and in terms of, of you know, visibility, is incredible, and it's gonna get even bigger through 
CMLs, TikTok, Metaverse, Web3, and you know, technology is gonna help us manage all of that. But at the heart of it is a music fan. You know, there's, there's people sitting there <laughs> with an understanding of music and an experience of music. I think this is a really like nice that. way to, <laughs> <laughs> to move to the audience. Uh, is anyone, yes, if you can, please stand up and uh, say your name. Uh, your name, uh, if you're a... Sure. Hi, I'm Jose Anlog. I'm an independent artist. And I'm, thank you so much. I was wondering if there are any platforms you use as music supervisors, especially, uh, to find tracks from independent artists who aren't working with a big publisher. Um, and a follow-up question would be if whether we as independent artists put our music into this uh, commercial li libraries that are kind of like pre-approved uh, for specific rates or whatever, if that decreases our chances of getting into like big syncs, like the more a song is synced into smaller projects, would that decrease our chances of getting synced into bigger projects or not at all? Uh, those would be my, my questions. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Well, for, uh, to look for independent artists, I go, which I actually do a lot. <laughs> um, well, I use, uh, I use uh, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, Spotify, concerts, uh, mouth to mouth, so I use a little bit of everything. I am um, about music libraries. That's a delicate subject, actually, because I, um, I have, I believe most of music supervisors or lots we have like a thing with music. We don't like music libraries, <laughs> you know? It's like, uh, I remember when I first arrived to Spain and I started like to, you know, contacting production companies here. And they would tell me music actually got a pretty small percent of the budget and they would like musicalize a lot of the films with like music, library music. I was like, <laughs> that really hurts my heart. So I, I don't really go to music libraries. I, I try to avoid it as much as I can. Of course, I will always um, make a use of them when, for example, you have a scene where you need a little bit of music, but it's more to support like the sound design of the scene more than the music itself. It's, so of course, I'm gonna use it instead of paying for clearing a song that is not actually gonna be you know, heard, but... Um, but, and, and I do believe that um, what we were, it's a, a little bit like what David was talking about now, even small, um, uh, achieving small um, things in small projects doesn't really kill the possibility of being uh, synced afterwards in a super big project. Actually, I think it then actually happens the other way around because what we were talking about just before, the same way, uh, they were talking about how Spotify, you know, like um, Place or Shazam uh, searches can really increase after a song is uh, being synced. I've had so many artists and publishers and labels, Cobalt, one of them, at some point that, you know, they just sent me emails and it was like, it's insane what has happened with this artist. And you see it because you have, you know, you get your artists that you really like and you go back to them and you listen to them and suddenly you realize the song that you cleared at one point that had, I don't know, 10,000 views now has 3 million or whatever and you're like, whoa, that changed and the price for sure changed, no? <laughs> but it's good for the artists and it's nice to see it, so, yeah. I, th I think also something we see is uh, once a, a song has been synced or an artist has been synced, is being requested more often. The, yeah. there, there's brands they want to say that they are risky, but also <laughs> play it safe. So they won't put someone that if they seen it on a on a different ad, maybe not the same kind of uh, industry, but they think okay, this this actually can work. So, and I think also as an artist, if you're going to put your music into a music library, you're letting go of all the rights, right? You're taking a check, and and that your publishing and master rights have, have pretty much gone. Very important point. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, it, and, and, I, and I agree with everything, you know, it's interesting to see when, when an, an artist or a song gets one sync, it tends to get two, three, four. It does, it does happen. It's something we all observe. So, yeah. Keep going. Bye. Check. Can, can, you you please, can you please stand up so they can see also behind? This message is for Emma. You say that she used disco. Um, I don't know because I'm new to this game, so I don't. So I'm just starting to use disco, but in the disco account, you're able to enter your metadata. Do you judge that too when you when you come across tunes like 
does it matter if, if an artist already has an ISRC code or an ISWC or anything like that? Does that affect your decision? Well, so because I, I'm not pitching music, I'm just working with the catalogue that we work with. So the, the metadata that we have in Disco has been uh, ingested, this is so technical and boring, ingested, so <laughs> all the information that goes to Spotify is also in Disco, so it has all of our <coughs> correct metadata in it. So we, we do some additional tagging ourselves on, uh, that are more related to sync. So if, if we've got a song, for example, like Jungle Busy Earning, like I, I will put our own kind of tags on it that are related to why that would be used in an ad but the general metadata comes from Spotify, which is done by our operations team. So it is all, yeah, it's all correct. I, I will jump in here because the panel, well, the workshop that we have afterwards, it's all about how to present the metadata to have more chances to get sync. So we have the amazing Patti Carreras, I will explain later, but there's gonna be a lot of questions answered in the next workshop about how to use Disco, other tools, how to communicate with the supervisor. So I, I just take the chance to, you know, stay with us for the next one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More questions? While we're waiting on that, I'll just add to, to that. If you're sending music to anybody looking for sync, make sure they can find you and make sure that you've got as much metadata in there as possible. Do you guys all use Disco? Yes, we do at Interstellar. Many, many people do, yeah. It's, it's the industry standard. No, no, it's cool. It's, you, listen, it's a perfectly, it's a very good question. And at basic, you've got your audio file, you've got the song title, you've got the artist, you should have the writer, you should have the ISRC code, you should have the ISWC code, and a contact detail saying, you know, what rights you control in that. Because when it leaves Disco and it goes to Paulina or to any other music supervisor, to Joan, basically when they open it up and they find the, the song, and they're like, I love this song, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get this song a massive sync, and there's no metadata, they can't do anything with it. But it's not scary to see an ISRC code or any type of advice. No, it's, no, it's good. It's good to see that. It means that the artist has it's taken the care scary. to do <laughs> something. It's a blessing. <laughs> you find that tagging and listening to songs is a better method than actually having contact with the composer. Do you find yourself doing it better that way so that there's no... When you say tagging, you mean, you mean tempo, genre, instrumentation? Oh. I mean, I, There's a reason why you tag. There's a reason why these songs are on the website. You, you are on that website and you're picking songs. So the question is, do you find yourself doing that more than communicating with the composer? What I would say, if I'm understanding the question correctly, is that the tagging helps to put songs in front of me, and then I'm listening, and I'm making a judgment call based on my you know, years of experience of listening to music. And, but it, it helps bring, if you like, the, the feast in front of me, and then I'll choose what I'm going to actually eat, yes. if it's a food analogy, sorry. No, because at the end, I mean, sorry to jump in, but <clears throat> I mean, you're not going to have a direct connection with all the artists that you're listening to, because that would be like impossible, because we listen to a lot of music. So basically, you're going to listen to all the music that you want. Your metadata is really going to help you find uh, the music, and it's actually going to help you to get your royalties back once that metadata goes into the cue sheet. But um, we will have a lot of contact with the human team that we are developing the musical project with, you know, the musical concept of the film. because. And you will have the con and we will have the contact with the labels and with the publishers or the producers that I'm working with, but definitely not directly with all the artists that I'm working with. No? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have another one. Thanks. Hello, Maria, music manager. Uh, do you even bother when you find a song by an emerging artist? It's amazing. You want to put it somewhere. Do you even bother to move forward with that, even if the metadata is still lacking? Yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult to find a great song, <laughs> and then if you find of it, you're going to dig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that we do at Interstellar is if there is an artist that we found that we think is amazing and the, the, the data is, or the, the, the metadata is incomplete, 
we do a forensic analysis of that, and if you come and work with us, then we look at it and we make sure everything is completely clean, and then you have, you know, then it can move really quickly into sync. Um, poor registrations, misregistrations, tricky data can often mean the difference between landing a sync and maybe losing a sync that you could have landed if, if your registrations were good. So I think it's on the manager and the artist. You know, there's, yeah, there's a whole important. thing that's happening in the UK at the moment about when the recording is made, get that data in there. You know, who are the writers, who are the splits, um, who, who owns yes. the master, and, and so that it can be found. So it's, it's yeah, good data is really important, but that's another whole thing. So I think this gentleman here might have had a question. He had a question. Hi, I'm Check, check, okay. Um, my name is John Bang 808 I'm an artist, producer, and I'm wondering, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I get the sense that the most like Shazam hits are really from the 80s and 90s and not like 2000s and up until now. Is there like a reasoning behind it? What is your feeling on that? Like, is it harder for newer stuff to like really have an impact? I, is that right? I don't know if, is that a statistic that, that yeah, Shazam no sees idea. more <laughs> 80s or 90s <laughs> things? That's interesting. I have a feeling that more the 80s and 90s are really like having an impact on Shazam charts. I, I, I mean, I think Emma mentioned it before. I think there's a, there's a moment now when the, revival. the 90s is very yeah. much a, a, a kind of trendy, kind of cool thing, and people are looking back at that, that era. So that, that might explain that. The, the, yes, the, the short answer is yes, absolutely, and it may not be that they get, got all the PR that Kate Bush did. Uh, you know, I don't think we have time at the moment. We had an artist who, who was a contemporary artist in 2019, and she got a placement in a reality TV show and ended up selling 900,000 copies on the back of the Shazam thing that just happened off the back of that. So it can happen at any moment. It doesn't have to be Kate Bush from 1978, I think, is, the, is when that record came out. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Or, yeah, <laughs> or, um, uh, or, you know, something from the 90s. A sync can connect with a mass audience at any point. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of, a, of a, there's, there's tons of really good examples of those, but, um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah. It's just making that magic happen, no? Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think, and the 80s and 90s thing, I think, is a, is a trend at the moment, but, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Well, Thank you, thank you so much for this panel. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. And as I mentioned before, um, after this panel, we're gonna have the fantastic Patti Carreras, one of the, or if not the best music supervisors in Mexico. Um, and she will, she's saying, no, 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 why you said that? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, okay, sorry, Patti. Okay, that's, that's a subjective uh, analysis of my limited knowledge, but anyway. She's a, definitely a great communicator, and she's gonna be telling us, explaining which is the best way to communicate to music supervisors. Metadata, what type of metadata you need to put in, um, how you should actually communicate. It's an email, it's a, in another way, so she's gonna, uh, explain to us and, and uncover some of the mysteries of the communication in a panel that is called, or a workshop that is called, Supervisors Do Not Have Superpowers. Um, uh, but yeah, that's going to be like in five minutes, you can grab a coffee, uh, some order. But before that, please, a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.